Okay, Rabbi say, we're going to finish Psalm 123 today. And today is Chav Peshvat, or was Chav Peshvat, Rebbe Tzins Yilula. And this is the capital, this is the chapter of Tilim that Hasidim recite, corresponding to her years, so it's a little special. Okay, we have gone through the first verse, that was, that was one episode, we went through the second verse, and now we're going to go through the last two verses, verse 3 and 4, and try to understand what David HaMelech, or the psalmist, is saying. We have learned that we are lifting our eyes. And we're lifting our eyes like servants. We're lifting our eyes to Hashem in subservience. We also learned that this chapter of Tehillim has a lot to do with the length of Galus and the derision and the scorn that we had to suffer. These are things, themes that we touched upon. So as we move into the last two verses of this psalm, much of that will be revisited and like taken to the next level. One of the things we talked about in the previous episode was betachem, trust in Hashem, and we'll touch on that as well. But specifically, in this held in contempt, we are going to have an appreciation of how we pray, how we daven, and by virtue of what we, as Hashem's special children, can expect to be answered with as you'll see. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. Verse 3 of Psalm 123. Hashem choneinu. The word choneinu comes from the term grace. Our previous episode was until grace because we said adshe choneinu. So here we are asking now for more grace. Before we davened until grace. And now we're saying, Choneinu Hashem Choneinu, which can be translated as, be gracious to us. We're asking Hashem that Hashem should be gracious to us. Another way of translating it is not as gracious, but rather as Hashem granting us favor. So, what, what, is, what, what does that mean in plain English? Because this is like, uh, you know, biblical mumbo jumbo. So what does it mean to be gracious? What does it mean to give grace or, or, or to show favor? Lee, what do you think it means? Um, that the, your connection, your relationship to Hashem is open and there's, there's a flow of positive and support from, from Hashem. We've created a, an appropriate vessel to receive what He wants us to have. So let's, let's, um, let's put it this way. That's appreciation, appreciation. appreciation from Hashem? Like to be no, the opposite. We don't act usual as He wants us to, uh, to, uh, to be. So let's let's let let me let me let me let me use what everybody's saying here. Let me give you a little metaphor. We all pay bills. Or we all there are, there's money that we give, money we dispense. I've never yet met the person who enjoys paying a parking ticket. Much less a speeding ticket. Right? You don't do it with joy. Say, sure, I'm so happy to give this to you. I love supporting my city and my province and my country. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to pay into the government fund. You ever met such a person? No. Yeah. You, you, you met such a person? No. No. How's about... But I've given them a lot. Oh, I'm sure you've given them. Have you? <laughs> Everybody's written checks like that or swiped a card like that. But nobody does that with joy. How's about... You have a birthday of a grandchild, for example, or a child, or a spouse, maybe a sibling, a friend, somebody you love very much. Does it hurt? Does it hurt to write that check? Does it hurt to swipe the card? Or are you happy to do it? What about maybe somebody did you a favor and they went out of their way for you and finally you have an opportunity to repay the favor? And they don't eat anything. You say, no, 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 it's fine. And finally, you can, you can grab lunch for them. How do you feel about that? You feel good about it, right? So when we ask Hashem for grace, of course, everything we get comes from Hashem. It's not as if, you know what, God? I don't need you today. Be like that. That's fine. I'll, I'll do this by myself. That's silly. Because everything we have comes from Hashem. 
beginning with our very existence and our very life. But what we're asking Hashem is not that we should continue to exist. Not that we should be or we should receive. We're asking that Hashem should be gracious to us. We're asking for that relationship. We're asking for that closeness. We're asking that Hashem should show us compassion and mercy. And, and you can see that sometimes. It depends on the way we receive what we're receiving. A, a, person, a person can get parnasa in the sense that he or she can pay the bills, but it comes in a, an embarrassing way. Or, or it comes in a way where your dignity is preserved or even edified. So that depends how Hashem chooses to give it to us. <laughs> There's a famous story they tell of the Hasidic Rebbe. Hey, Hasidic Rebbe in a shtetl somewhere. He used to live really from people's, uh, people would come and they would ask him to pray and they would leave him some money. And when he would do Berchat HaMazon, there was one portion, one, one sentence of Berchat HaMazon that he would recite with tremendous concentration. Every time, always, never failed. What was the portion? He would say, Loli day matnat Batsar basar vadam. Not, not handouts. Not handouts. Loli dei matnatam. Not their gifts. Ki'im, rather, biyodcha hamleya ha'psucha v'agdoisha. Hashem, give it to me from your hand. So, so his children once said to him, they said, Dad, you know, we live from handouts. <laughs> what do you mean when you say, you're always concentrating, you're saying, loli dei matnas basar vadam, v'leli dei havasam. That's, uh, that's the gig we're in. You know, like you're a Rebbe and you're a holy man and you pray for people. And, you know, that's how it was in Poland in the little shtetl. He said to them, you don't understand. If the people come and they give me whatever it is, the largest that they are capable of these, these small shtetl people, and they don't feel my prayers are working and they don't feel like I'm really adding much to their life. They feel like they're giving me a handout. He said, but if Hashem listens to my prayers and the people are being uplifted and inspired by my teaching and by my presence, he says, then they're not looking at it as a handout. Then they feel they got their money's worth. When I, when, I, when I say these words, I ask Hashem, my prayers should be accepted, especially those on behalf of others, and I ask Hashem that my teaching of Torah and my attempts to inspire should be effective. So this is, we're asking Hashem for grace. Ask Hashem for grace. Choneinu Hashem. That's on a literal level. It's just on a literal level. We'll ask Hashem to be gracious to us, now, you'll remember that there's a very long galut over here. And we don't want to just continue with the same old. We want to have a change already. It's like it's high time. Hashem promised to bring us Mashiach. We're asking Hashem to be gracious to us. We're asking Him not just to keep existing, but we're asking Hashem to turn the page, to, to begin the next chapter, which is the days of Mashiach. Yes. Okay, but Hashem is always kind and loving and... You know, you 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 say that you say that, doctor. But think about it. We learned in the previous episode that Hashem is referred to by Yud Vavke, which represents Chesed, and you said that Hashem we learned is also referred to by Elokim, which represents judgment, judgment. judgment. and severity. and sometimes there's severity that comes from on high. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a there's there's right and left. This, this chesed and gvura. So it's not so simple. Now, the first thing you'll notice here is that the psalmist repeats himself. Choneinu Hashem, choneinu. Be gracious. Be gracious. He just said that. Why, does, why is there a repetition of the, the be gracious? So the first stop that we're going to make is in the parking lot of the Radak. We're going to stop at Rabbeinu David Kimchi. We're going to sit down in his living room for a minute. And Radak says to us like this, Choneinu, Hakoil l'chazek ha This is coming to underscore and add emphasis to the request. When you ask for it twice, it's that much more important. In other words, it's not a casual ask. Can you please, please, Choneinu Hashem, Choneinu. Emphasis added. Why? Why is there emphasis added? He says, look at the next words in this verse. The first three words are, Choneinu Hashem, Choneinu, which is repetitious. The next words are, Ki Rav, because it's a lot. 
Because it's a lot. Savainovuz. It's a lot. And we have been sated, filled with scorn or disgrace. So the Radak says, Ki Rav, it's a lot, refers not to the quality of derision or the intensity of the scorn, but it refers to the length of time. So there are, there are you know, there could be a, a situation where we have an uncomfortable experience and people will say to you, it was mercifully short. Yes, it was uncomfortable. I didn't want to be there. I had to go. And I got through it. It was mercifully short. And then a person could say, I went somewhere. Yeah, well, it wasn't that bad. Oh, but it took forever. What would you choose? A, 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 high, a, high, in, a high intensity discomfort or scorn or disgrace, but it's over quickly, or having to live through it and live through it and live through it. Most people would say, let's get it over with quick. Give me the first option. <laughs> Hit me hard, and that's it. I don't want to see you again. Here, the reality is that we're in Galut for a very long time. 1950 years is a long time. So he says, that's why it, there's a need for emphasis. Rabbi Shalom, this is not cool anymore. It's a very long time. So we say, Lechazek HaVarkasher, Ki Zman Aruch, it's a very, very long time, Savainu Vuz Hagolos, that we are ingesting or being, so to speak, overwhelmed, filled, sated, if you will. That's very euphemistic because it doesn't satisfy anybody. We're like overflowing, sickened already by the amount of derision and scorn you've had to put up with. So that's the, that's the Radak. Radak reads this verse as an emphasis on the length of the exile. And you remember, we started out talking about this particular chapter of Tilim, which is written in the name or in the voice of the Bnei Hagola, or the leader of the children of Israel in time of Galut, in time of exile. And it's very long. And we're pleading with Hashem. We had enough already. So the psalmist wasn't speaking for himself. He was speaking about a futuristic reality. He's talking in our voice. That's the way the Radak puts it. The Ibn Ezra, very interestingly, he does not transcribe the word chonenu alone. Radak says chonenu. What's chonenu? He said chonenu twice. So he says, let's go, it's for emphasis. The Ibn Ezra transcribes the words chonenu ki rav. And he says, he adds two words. Zman rav. This is not about quality, it's quantity. It's not about intensity, it's about duration. So, chonenu. Why be gracious? Because it's been a long time. And Mashiach is a long time in coming. Rabbeinu Vidal Tzafarti has a very, very elegant and creative way of understanding the double expression, the redundant expression of Choneinu. It's pretty clear that most of the Rishonim assume that this is stylistic. And, to be sure, in the book of Tillam, there is a lot of poetic style. And there is a lot of times where there's add, adding words for emphasis or even repeating words for emphasis. But nonetheless, Rav Vidal felt that there was some kind of deeper message here in addition to emphasis. And he suggests the following. We, the Jewish people, have endured doubly in Galut. We have endured Physical suffering. He says, Aleph is Dvarim Hagufniim on a corporeal level. The pogroms, the beatings, the Holocaust. Terrible stuff. And even when we weren't being beaten, we were being oppressed. In certain places, both in Europe and North Africa, Jews had to pay a tax just because. It's the way it is. If you weren't part of the state religion, you pay a tax to exist. They taxed us to death. They literally made it impossible to live. So that's all material things. So whether it's physical beatings, whether it's actually burning our homes and, 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 and chasing us away, which we had plenty of that, there was also, uh, even in the good times, 
we're, we're paying a price, a physical material price to be Jewish. And then he says there's another level of persecution. And that is not on a physical or material sense, but hadbeiz is bedvarim hanafshim. That's with regard to spirituality. And this is bebitol teira o mitzvahs, where the world seeks to impose upon us a cessation of our observance. They want to detract from our observance. They don't like the fact that we remain loyal to the ways of our ancestors, that we're committed to Hashem. And this has been the case in goals, time and again. Uh, who, who, who is they? Who is they? Yeah. <laughs> a whole motley crew of wonderful nations. Okay. Uh, tell me, who isn't they? To the best of my knowledge, I could be wrong, but to the best of my knowledge, the only country in the world where Jews have lived, there's been a historic presence of Jews, where there wasn't, at some point, overt anti-Semitism. And I say overt anti-Semitism in a very broad way. Right. It, it could have been something like, you know, just, just taking advantage or, or bullying or taking money to everything to actual mass murder. The only country is India only country and nobody knows why but it's a fact now in, in, in this I believe in the 14th or 15th century there was a major invasion in India a Muslim invasion and and after that persecution started but they weren't indigenous Indians the Indians themselves the indigenous I guess you would call them Hindus were never never persecuted the Jewish people now, there have been countries where there are no Jews. Sometimes there are countries with no Jews filled with anti-Semitism anyway. Go, go ask, why was Japan uh, allied with Hitler? I mean, like, how many Jews did Japan have? That's altogether strange. Spain? Are you kidding, Dustin? The worst anti-Semitism. You, you got to be joking. Spain once had more Jews than anywhere else in the world. Gator Sfara, the, the Holocaust there lasted for 101 years from 1398 to 1499. Achashverosh was a Moshel Bekipa. He was an empire. So if there was anti-Semitism, then it would have been coming from Haman, from the top. And I, I, don't, I don't know with certainty what was going on. It says, Kush. It does say that, but the Gemara records two opinions as to what that means. In one opinion, it incorporates India as, as well. As well, the other opinion, it doesn't. So, and again, I'm, ju I'm just saying this only because you asked me. I have a, a, a compelling theory. I don't know. I mean, I find it compelling. <laughs> I have this theory that it says Avram Avinu fathered a whole bunch of children with Hagar, who was the Egyptian princess that eventually became a concubine in Avram's house. And it says he sent them El Eretz Kedem. He sent them to the land of the east. And it is interesting. It's still called it the Far East. It's still called the East. So... That's just my hunch. It's based on absolutely nothing, and I may be 100% wrong. So if you, if you can disprove that, no problem. It's not Torah. <laughs> I'm telling you right now it's not Torah. But it's interesting. It's interesting. What, what, if, what if that actually those are the children of Avram Avinu? It says, Masr lehem shem tumah. He gave them the ability to contend with what we would call, uh, I guess, kind of like a spirit worship. But unfortunately, they didn't contend with it. They succumbed to it. But he gave them the ability to deal with it. The ability not to be enchanted by it. But if you think about you know, that culture and civilization, maybe, maybe there's something there. Either way, whether, whether, whether <laughs> this is accurate or not about Eretz Kedem, I don't know. But it is, to the best of my knowledge, an established fact, at least since we started keeping history, that the Indian government and the Indian people have never been persecutorial towards the Jewish community, and there was a Jewish community. So without sending us off topic, what, why are all these Why? Oh, you have any easy questions for tonight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to have a break of doing these things. I'm, gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to be coy and answer your question in just a very small way because you're asking and it's fair that you should get an answer. There's a medrash that tells us that the name of Har Sinai is derived from the fact that Misham Yarda Sina La'olam that this mountain called Sinai 
was also the time and place where sin'ah, where hatred came down to the world against the Jewish people. Even though people like to talk about the Egyptian bondage as an example of anti-Semitism, the first real example of anti-Semitism, because we were in a nation before, the first time we have you know, people who hate Jews as a nation, is after we're born, it's a few weeks after, and Reish is Goyim, who is the first one to attack us? Amalek. Amalek. And I talked about last Shabbos. And they came in the tunnels. They dug tunnels. They dug tunnels, the Medrashas. To get under, to get under, they're still digging tunnels, huh? To get under the security wall of the, of the, of the uh, cloud of glory. And they, and they, and they raped and they mutilated, genitally mutilated their victims. Clear medrash. It's clear in the Sifri. It's like, like scary. So Amalek is the first major launch of anti-Semitism. And it says that up until Amalek, everybody was in awe of the nation of Israel. And Amalek was like a crazy guy, a wild man. It was a hot bath. Everybody was afraid to jump in. And one guy jumped in. He burned himself. But once he jumped in, it wasn't so hot anymore. Once he jumped in, others began to jump in as well. But that's the story that we're told. If you, if you look in the Gemara in Mesechet Megillah that describes two of the most famous anti-Semites in Jewish history, Haman and Achashverosh. Achashverosh was anti-Semite too. It says that there is a metaphor that's given. And the metaphor is that Haman said, I have a pile. I have a pile. I don't know what to do with it. I have this pile. And Akashverosh said, I have a ditch. I need it filled. So why don't you take your pile of dirt and put it in my ditch? And this is the two kinds of anti-Semites. There's the anti-Semite who is frustrated by the Jews. It becomes like an obstacle. It's in his way. Somehow your wealth on showing the way you want to live your life, the Jew gives you, uh, shall we say, a, a sense of discomfort. Hitler, your machshim of zichro, he said the Jew invented the conscience, and for this we will never forgive him. Right? So we're getting in the way of their, what they want from life. Somehow the Jew represents the things they don't want to hear about. And Achashverosh feels a sense of emptiness. Mm -hmm. His whole life is filled with just... His, his, and, and somehow his Jewish neighbors, he finds there's meaning there. So these are the two kinds of jealousies. And both jealousies lead to some pretty horrible stuff. And I don't think that there's a logical or cogent explanation for anti-Semitism. And certainly it shouldn't be for us to prove it. I think it is an illogical hatred. And if we give it a reason or an explanation for it, we're almost like, uh, we're almost gratifying it. We're, we're, we're dignifying it. We're giving it some kind of, uh, some, some room. Like, why would we do that? But this is a, a reality we've had to deal with. And... And, and the Reb Vidal Tsefarti points out that we say, Chonenu Hashem Chonenu. The reason we're asking for Hashem's grace, and we're going to come back to grace soon, the reason we're asking for the grace is because we have been sated with scorn. We've been the butt of jokes and we've been abused and, and denigrated and mocked. And the events of the last few months are not really any different. The way, the way you know, me too, except you if you're a Jew. And the way every country in the world is expected to defend its citizens except for the Jewish state. And we could go on about that. So we have suffered both forms of derision. And as such, Rav Vidal says, we have to emphasize, Chaneinu Hashem Chaneinu. If it wasn't one thing, it's been the other thing. It's never been easy or natural for a Yid to live a Yiddish life. And it's just been, we had enough. So we're pleading with Hashem Please take it away. When I learned this teaching of Rav Vidal Tzofarti, it's quoted in the Migdash Mat, in, in the, the commentary called Beis Knesses, I, I, I thought of a famous talk that the Rebbe delivered in the 1950s. And the Rebbe asked a question about the Egyptian bondage, the slavery of the Jewish people that is narrated in the opening of the book of Exodus in Parshat Shemot. At a certain point, the Pharaoh, to deal with his Jewish problem or his Hebrew problem, he has a solution, a final solution. He's going to throw the babies into the river. He makes a, there's an edict, there's a decree, all of the Jewish babies should be thrown into the river. And the daughters, techayun, 
make sure they stay alive. So the Rebbe asked, first of all, why does Pharaoh care about the Jewish girls? If, if there's a reason for us for him to kill the Jewish babies because he's convinced that there is going to be a savior born. And the only way for there not to be a savior, you got to kill all the saviors. And we don't know which baby it is, so kill all the babies. So then why do you have to say Why do you have to make them live? Why does the Pharaoh all of a sudden is worried about paying for formula? And, and if the Pharaoh hated the Jews so much, why did he just throw them all into the river? And the Rebbe says an amazing thing. Galut Mitzrayim, the exile of Egypt, is a paradigm for all future exiles, it says. That's the origin, that's the source. And if you ever want to understand the exile and the pitfalls and what we're supposed to do to overcome those challenges, just go back to Galut Mitzrayim. It's all there. It's all written already. And the Pharaoh wanted to destroy the Jewish people, but in two ways. He physically wanted to destroy the Jewish baby boys. And his hope was that the Jewish baby girls could be assimilated into Egyptian society. Techayun means make them a part of our way of living. So they would marry Egyptian men and become part of the Egyptians, assimilation. And really and truly, assimilation is not less dangerous for our existence than physical persecution. It's not less dangerous. You know, <laughs> one of the most difficult things that I sometimes have to do is, you know, you speak to a boy who's in love with a girl who Torah says he shouldn't marry, and it's not going to work out. So it's, it's not. Uh... And by the time they're in that position already, like nothing I'm going to say is really going to matter. And I think I have one instance in which I actually remember being successful. It's almost. I think I have one. I have. I, I remember one. Boy, I haven't seen him. This is like over 20 years ago. I remember that he was visiting from Budapest. And there was a Hungarian Jewish boy. And he was very seriously dating and planning to marry uh, a non-Jewish young lady. And we had a long talk. And I got regards later that he should know that he thought all about it. And he wants to be Jewish. And because he wants to be Jewish, he, he gave it up. But I think it's like, that's like my only recollection of success. So one of my most stunning failures that hurt for a long time is I'm, I'm sitting with this young man and I'm explaining to him how you know, Jewish survival, it's, don't, don't you care about that? And he says, of course I do. My, my grandparents, they survived Auschwitz. And I, I knew that his grandparents survived Auschwitz. And I said, you know, six million. It's actually a much higher number. I said, like, you realize if you marry out of the faith, your children won't be Jewish anymore. So imagine this. He says, if, if all the Jews marry out of the faith, that's it. In one generation, there's no more Jews. You're just like basically repeating the, the, the same disaster of the last generation that came to us with them physically killing Jews. You're going to just marry us out of existence. And he's like, are you calling me a Nazi? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just kind of stating the facts. It did not go well. Anyway, that's a <laughs> it was... It probably was too late. I, I, I certainly didn't use that argument in a, not in a cavalier way anymore. It, was a, it wasn't good. You learn. You live and learn. It was, it, was not, it, was not, it was not really effective at all. But in general, like a, what, 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 are you, what are you supposed to say? When somebody's in that position already, like your parents call me, I have a little problem. See, a little problem? You had a problem 25 years ago. <laughs> now, now, now you have a problem? So, so this, is the, this is the reality that Vidal says. And the, the suffering has been on, 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 both, on both ends. I just thought of that sikh of the Rebbe. Anyway, so that's what he says. According to Rav Vidal, that's why we have this redundancy of Chaneinu Hashem Chaneinu. Yitzhi wants to know if Halacha, Esav, Sayyidina Liyankiv is part of that. Yeah, you could say it is. The Tehillah Hashem adds one very interesting detail. And it's certainly not on a pshat level, but it's interesting. He says, you know that the Jewish people, our suffering has been quite unique. As they say in Yiddish, not stam suffering. It's like, like off the charts kind of suffering. You, know, you look at the history of Jewish people, it's just unbelievable. And he says, there's an expression that our sages use. That, we 
were struck in double measure, and we will have a nechama bekiflayim. Because when the prophet Yeshayo brings us a message of God's comfort, he says twice, nachamu, nachamu ami. God speaking through the prophet says, comfort, comfort my nation. About this our sages say, there was a double, so to speak, punishment, laku bekiflayim, we suffered, in double measure, and so the comfort will come in double measure. So the Til Hashem wants to suggest that the Choneinu, Choneinu is part of that. It's part of that. That doesn't exactly add up because Laku B'Kiflayim is in the past tense. And the Nechama B'Kiflayim is in the future. But at any way, he says this is a way to look at the redundancy. It's not inherently different than the words of the Radak and Ibn Ezra, only it's not just emphasizing the length of time, it's also emphasizing the intensity rather than only the duration. So it says it's been a, a very intense, difficult, and challenging galut. And uh, I don't think anybody can argue with that, unfortunately. So we say, Choneinu Hashem Choneinu. Why should Hashem be gracious to us? He says, I'll tell you why. Ki, because... Rav Savainovus, because we have suffered so much derision, because we have suffered so much, so much abuse. This is very hard to understand. What's the logic? Choneinu Hashem Choneinu? Because we learn Torah, because we're doing mitzvahs, because we're coming home to you. No. Be gracious to us because we suffered a lot. Why is that a reason to be gracious? Like, what's the logic here? There's, there's, some, there's a case being made. This is not simply a prayer. This is a prayer with the, a, a logic behind the prayer. Chaneinu Hashem. You know why Chaneinu? Kirav sovainu vuz. Because we have sated with scorn. So what is the pshat? What, is, what, 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 is it, what does it even mean? The Mitzudah's David says, what is the meaning of Kirav? He says, Bo lanu bizoyin harbe. We have had so much derision, so much denigration. We're like, we're like, we're like sated, we're like stuffed, overwhelmed from the volume. And he says, it's a, it's, a, it's a euphemism, it's like stylistic. So the Mitzudah's David seems to be emphasizing not the duration of time, but the intensity, not duration, but intensity. But the simple question is, why is duration or intensity a reason for God's graciousness? What's the reason here? What's the, what's, so to speak, what's behind the request for this prayer? So I didn't find, in, in virtually any of the other commentaries, I didn't find really like a, a clear explanation. But when I looked in the Yahel Ur of the Tzemach Tzedek, and the Midrashim that he sends us off to, I started to understand certain things. So I want to I share with you what the Tzemach Tzedek writes in Yahalur. It's very cryptic. I want to go back to the Midrashim, share the Midrashim with you. And it seems to me maybe that this is indeed the Pshat. This is, this is how we should understand this verse in Tehillim. The Tzemach Tzedek in Yahalur says like this, He says, look in Parshas Vayishlach. Look in chapter 75 there. And he says, read up on the business of Eved Veshivcha, servant and maidservant. And you'll see that the Medrash there invokes our chapter of Tilim. That the maidservant, Yaakov Avinu, Father Jacob, sends a message to his brother Esau, Esau, who represents all those anti-Semitic nations. Amalek is, after all, a great-grandson of his. And he says that Yaakov Avinu says, I had shor and chamor, ox and donkey. And then he says, Eved v'shivcha. So look what it says in the Medrash, he says. And see how the Medrash frames this idea of, of our verse in Tilim. All right? The Tzemach Tzadik doesn't explain himself. And the Medrash isn't so explanatory either. <laughs> but once I knew that Tzemach Tzadik was telling us that the answer is going to be found in this Medrash, I, I read the Medrash till, till it made sense to me. So let me read to you the words of the Medrash and let me share with you how I came to understand it. The Medrash says like this, just citing these two words from the scripture, 
That's in the Pasuk. I had evidence Shivcha. Says the Medrash. Hine cheene avodim al That's Psalm 123. Behold, lifting the eyes like avadim, like servants, to the master. And then he says... In other words, the Eved V'shifcha that Yaakov Avinu speaks of is not only a metaphor, a parable for the future Jewish people in exile, but it also will explain the Choneinu Hashem Choneinu. Hmm. What does that mean? So here's L'cha'ira, how we have to understand it. When we call ourselves an Evid or a Shifcha, a servant or a maidservant of God, what does this mean? It's a good thing. Totally subservient. totally subservient, totally dependent. As we learned about in the previous episodes, when we see ourselves as Evid or Shifcha, we're saying, God, bring your hands. We don't have anywhere else to go. This, <laughs> you're it. That's the only address we know of. And, and we're, we're, not only, we're not only dependent, we're reliant, and we're trusting in you. The betachen idea. Remember, that's the trust in Hashem. And that's the meaning of ke'eni avadim ayadadineim. So, when we are like servants, are we beloved in Hashem's eyes? Let's think back to what we learned about in the previous episode teaching of Rebbe Levi Yitzchel and the teaching of the Malbim. When we are like servants, because we can be like servants, or we can be like children. So when we're like servants, are we chaviv? Are we beloved? Are we cherished in God's eyes? Not, not so. Not so much. No. Does the master have love for his servant? It's a loyalty thing. It's a commitment. So we're not kibonim, but like avodim. Okay, let's just follow this through. But Hashem is still providing for us because we're His servants. You don't have to love your servant. You have to provide for your servant. They're your servant. So, in the verse, and this is what the Mepharshim says, in the verse, Yaakov Avinu says, Ve'eshlecha, I'm sending these servants. I'm sending them to you. To find favor in your eyes, to find grace in your eyes. In other words. Now, on a literal level, Yaakov is talking to Esau, to Esau, on a literal level. But there's like, there's like a metaphor here that's going on. And the metaphor then is even in the event that we don't have a tremendous amount of of merit, we're still your servants. Even if we haven't been that fantastic, we're still your servants. And, and as servants who have suffered greatly, we deserve a break. Let's put it this way. During the Gulf War, there was a certain Rosh Yeshiva who spoke out in a very harsh way about secular Israelis. He spoke about uh, pig farmers, violation of Shabbat, and he said they deserve the scuds. And he said bad things would happen to the Jewish people. And the Rebbe said nothing bad was going to happen. This is before the scuds started falling. There was nothing bad was going to happen. There's going to be great miracles. Everything's going to be amazing. What happened? It was amazing. 39 scuds fell. Nobody was actually directly injured by a scud. I think there was one fatality, and that came from somebody who had a heart attack because they made him so anxious. One scud fell, or two scuds fell in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, and something like uh, 100 Marines were killed. Densely populated areas. Tremendous miracles. The Rebbe spoke about a haftorah in Parshas Vayikra. In response to this individual, who was considered a very prominent leader in the Haredi community, 
for, for speaking harshly about the Jewish people. And the Rebbe asked the question. It says, Am zuya li, This is the nation I formed for me. The nation I formed. They sing my praises. And the Rebbe's question was, what does this is the nation I formed have to do with singing my praises? Singing my praises is a choice they make. Being formed is a matter of fact. And the Rebbe said this, that the very fact that Jewish people, after everything they've been through in the last nearly two millennia, are still willing to identify as Jewish, still want to be proudly Jewish, Forget if they're learning Torah doing mitzvahs. They still even want to be Jewish. He said that's the greatest praise for Hashem. That we still want to be Jewish anyway. Okay, we're a little confused. We don't know how to be Jewish. We're, we, get, we got some of the details to still work out. But the very fact that here we are after so much suffering and we're still saying, yes, I'm Jewish. That's the greatest praise Hashem could possibly have. That's what the Rebbe said at the time. So listen, I don't know what the Tzemach, I can't tell you for sure what the Tzemach Tzedek is trying to say. I can't tell you what the Medish is trying to say, but this is how I understand it. We say to Ben Shalalem, yes, we are deficient. We are not the most fantastic uh, generation that ever lived. The Jewish people have made many mistakes. We could learn more Torah. We could be more, we could daven with greater fervor. We could be more observant. We could love each other more. Yes, it's all true. However, we're still your servants. We're still subservient. We're still looking to Hashem. And we suffered so much. So enough already. Choneinu Hashem, be gracious to us. Because even if we're just an Eved V'shivcha, even if we're just servants, even if we're not a Ben Ubas, even if we're not children, but Kirav Savainu Vuz, look, look how much we've suffered. Who has a story like the Jewish people's story? Who has so much sadness? Who has so much loss? Who has so much tragedy? And we're still at it. And we're still loyal. We still want to be Jewish people. And we still want to build Yiddishkeit. This is an amazing thing. So that's the pshat over here. The Medrash is telling us, I have a maid, I have a maid servant, I have an Eved, I want to find favor in your eyes. Even when we're just a servant, we can still find favor in Hashem's eyes. Ki rav sovainuvus. There's a, a beautiful letter from the Rebbe about the Gemara and the Sechet Tanit that speaks about the Shiduchim, matches that used to get made in the hills of Jerusalem on the 15th day of Menachem Av. And, and uh, it says there was, there was beautiful, there was beautiful uh, girls who said, look at beauty. And there was girls who were, were not beautiful. This is the whole discussion in the Gemara. How could it be uh, that Jewish girls not beautiful? <laughs> and the Gemara makes a statement it's like this. It says, B'nei Yisrael noisein. They're all beautiful. And the circumstances sometimes disfigure them. They're disfigured by circumstances. The Rebbe writes about this whole, these four different approaches. He talks about it all in spiritual terms. He said, B'nei Yisrael is a euphemism for neshamas. Every neshama is beautiful. Every soul is, is exquisite. And you find somebody who has a dark soul. You find somebody who has a disfigured, hideous soul. He said, really, really the soul is magnificent, but the circumstances have taken a toll. You know, there's the, the suffering, the pain has caused the hard lines and the, and the wrinkles to set in. So, so there's, this, there's this message that we're sending to Hashem that he ne'ke'eni avodim, we're like servants. We're looking at you like servants. We're looking at you like maid servants. But we're still dependent and we're still loyal. And we're asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We've suffered so much already. Even if our loyalty is only avodim and shvachis, even so, chaneinu Hashem, it's time for Hashem to be gracious to us. That's what I think the pshat is. Will it work? Will it work? Aren't we <laughs> I, sure, to do I, sure, I sure hope it's going to work. Yeah, well, you know, like walking my way, I've been raining. It's time. Like we have responsibility. Yeah. No. no the, listen. There's no. There's no question that um, in our relationship with God, we're in a meritocracy, and we, we're supposed to earn our keep. There's also no question that if we're going to wait till every single Jew is uh, perfect, including ourselves, that we'll be here forever. So this shouldn't, be, this shouldn't be understood as in lieu of. Okay, God, we're checking out. <laughs> we're not planning to do anything else, but, you know, now it's your turn. We're not saying that. 
We're asking Hashem Chaneinu. That's our prayer. You know, like they say in Yiddish, the Bein Shalom, Habrachmanus. Habrachmanus. Yes, yes, there are some faulty, but we're going to try harder. And, and there are some empty, there's some gaps, there's some empty areas. But you know what? We've suffered. We're sated with scorn. Such a long gallus. So much suffering. So many challenges. Like, like you know, put it into perspective. Yeah. If we would hope, if the light would shine, we would say, okay, and we'd all, but human nature being what it is, we're human nature is, uh, complacent. We, we, complacency is one of our many problems in gallus. It's one of our many problems. So, I, I think I mentioned this in one of the previous, one of my previous classes recently. Maybe one of you remember. The Rebbe used to lead a Fabrengen on the 15th day of Shvat, on Tu B'Shvat, Rosh Hashanah Le'ilan, or Ilan, not always. And they were very special Fabrengens. The Rebbe, the, the Rebbe had a, a special thing for Tu B'Shvat. And there is a, there's a this is on tape, I, I, I was a boy, this, I think it was 19... I think maybe 79, or maybe, maybe 77. There's a, the tape of this Fabrengen. And the Rebbe speaks about a, a story that happened with the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, whose name was Rebaruch of Mezhibush, Rebaruch Mezhibush. So Rebaruch once found a grandson of his who was very distraught. He was crying. Rebaruch said to his grandson, what's wrong? So he said, we were playing hide and go seek. I guess they played that in the shtetl too, whatever they called it. And he said, I hid very well, and nobody's looking for me anymore. They gave up. <laughs> they, they, they stopped looking. <laughs> he was crying. <laughs> nobody's looking for me. And a baruch understood this as a, a, on a deeper level as the problem that we're not looking for Hashem anymore. Hashem hid so well. He, <laughs> he concealed himself so intensely, so profoundly that he didn't stop looking. And the Rebbe was very emotional. The Rebbe would not really wear his heart in his sleep. He wouldn't express himself. Uh, when, when, if, you, if you heard the Rebbe break down by a Fabrengen, that was like a rarity. It means like you know, he, there was, he was a master of self-control. He controlled himself. To the, it was like so overwhelming that it actually... He, he started like sobbing. He started like, he, like, he started catching. He caught himself. The Rebbe said, Zunte gesucht. Monte gesucht. Look to Hashem. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. The Rebbe said, how, how much could you expect already? Hashem is hiding so well. How, how much could you expect? How much could you expect already? And the Rebbe said, like, like it's enough. Mashiach has to come. He, like, after everything we went through, like, and Hashem is hiding so well, how much do you want the people to look already? At some point, it's like to give up on the game. So this is, I think, the Pshat and the Pasuk. This is what's going on here. This is the Choneinu Hashem. And like, now you go back to the Radak and you go back to Ibn Ezra. And what is he talking about here? The length, the duration. It's not even the intensity. 1950 years. It's a very long time. Like Galut was uh, 210 years, 70 years. A, a few decades. 1900 years, almost 2000 years. Such a duration? Choneinu, like emphasis. This is crazy. He, he, we're sated with scorn. You, you know, they say that Golos has a way of cleansing us. And Golos has a way of, 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 of uh, humbling us. We're full already. We had a full. We, we drank it all. We ate it all. Enough genukshan. Like we say, how much more? How much more does Am Yisrael have to be humbled before we can merit to come home? and to be uh, restored to be at Hashem's table, so to speak. So I think this is the Pshat and the Pasuk. I think that's the Pshat. I think, I think, I think actually this is what the, I think that's the Medrash is saying. And very interestingly, the Tzemach Tzedek goes on to, to comment like this. He says, then for a better understanding, he says, take a look at Medrash Rabbah and Parshas Nasu. I'm just going to stop before I go on. I'm going to look at this guy. This Javanese guy is asking a lot of questions. He's going to have to respond to.
Yeah, so about your question about Moshe, his servant, they spoke about that on the previous episodes. You have to go back to the last episode and watch. There was a level of servant which is even higher than child. Miracle of 39 scuds. Um, we should not forget, no, we should not forget the, the miracles. And that was one of the things that I was very unhappy about. People didn't remember the miracles and thank Hashem enough. Um, we bear a grudge to Hashem. Chas v'shalom. No, we shall bear grudges. There is a video here. <laughs> Thank you. Toiv. So here, the, the Tzemach Tzedek says, take a look in, in the Medrash and Parshas Naso. And see over there, and what he says, v'yichuneka. And he says, the word v'yichuneka, which means to be gracious. It's the same word over here. In the Medrash, is actually interpreted as take us out of Galut. That's what it means. Remember I asked you what does it mean give us grace? So the Medrash says that grace is to remove us from Galut. And that kind of that kind of puts it together. So now let's take a look at the Medrash. The Medrash says what is the meaning of the verse in the, the verse in the Birchat Kohanim? It says Yivarecha Hashem Hashem should bless you Vishmarecha. And she should guard you. Then it says, Yor Hashem Panavilecha, Hashem should cause his countenance to shine towards you. Vichuneka. So the Gemara, kind of a, the Medrash, pardon me, Medrash Rabbah analyzes this word Vichuneka. And here the Medrash says like this. This is in the uh, 11th chapter of, of Medrash Rabbah of Bamidbar and Parshas Naso. Dovaracha. Vichuneka. Vichuneka means. Bimatnat chinam. Don't wait for us to earn it. Give it to us even if we don't deserve it. V'chein omer. And this is actually the meaning of what is said. And here we have a direct reference to Psalm 123. Chaneinu Hashem chaneinu. And then the next verse it says, Keinu ineinu al Hashem alekeinu ache. Pardon me, the verse before ache chaneinu until grace. Then the Medrash says after. Dovar acher. Vichuneka. Lahotziacha. Meshibud malchiyais. To take us out of the subjugation of governments. Subjugation of governments. And here the Eitz Yosef says something incredible. What's the difference between redemption, geula, and the subjugation of governments? Listen to what the Medrash says, the uh, H. Yosef commentary is. He says, you know, it is written that when Mashiach will come, it'll be like we left Mitzrayim. It'll be similar circumstances. It says, Ki Mitzrayim, just as in the time you left Mitzrayim, I will show you wonders. And here the H. Yosef says, Ukumaisha be Mitzrayim, Batla, Ha'avaida, Shisha Chadoshim, Koidem Yitziyasami Mitzrayim, just like in Egypt. The bondage, the slavery, the torture, the suffering stopped six months before they left. Stop Rosh Hashanah is when it stopped. They left six months later. So the last six months weren't so bad. He says, This is what it'll be like in the future. So let's, let's go with this. Samach Tzedek is telling us take a look in the Medish Rabbah. He says, don't look in the Medrash Rabbah where it quotes, where it cites the verse. Look in the next part of the Medrash Rabbah, Lo Hotziyah the continuation. And the Etzioso's commentary, when we're asking God for grace, we're asking God that in the last moments of Golos, we shouldn't suffer. The last moments of Golos should be at least a little easier. Ease up on us. It hasn't been very easy since we <laughs> We're asking Hashem not for October 7th. We're asking Hashem for the good days that, that we've known in the immediate past. And we're asking that meaning of be gracious to us. Chonenu Hashem, so according to this medrash and this interpretation, Chonenu Hashem Chonenu is not specifically asking for the coming of Mashiach, but at least ease up until Mashiach comes. Really, both are being requested. Is the Chonenu is the idea of Give, give us beyond what we deserve. But also that Hashem should ease up 
at least the subjugation of foreign governments should be lifted. You know, sometimes your children misbehave. Everybody has sometimes children that misbehave. And sometimes you have to discipline the children. And, or, or the, sometimes the children's like, misbehavior is disobedience. It's, it's not uh, they did anything terrible, but they didn't do the things they were supposed to do. So the parent who cares is trying to, is trying to discipline the children. So what happens when you punish the kids? And the kids are crying. And the kid's like, okay, okay, have Rachmanus. Fine, fine, fine. I'll be better. I'll do a little better. He doesn't really like, you know, swim all the laps. He doesn't come, he doesn't come full clean, but like he's crying out to you. And what does a normal parent do? You give him. Yeah, you give him. <laughs> you give him. He's right up the, 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 um, what's it called, the Nasi. What's his name? Forget. President. President. If you serve, if you're, uh, if you're a criminal, and if you serve, let's say, five years, the only the president can give you Khanina. Right, yeah. In the United States, also like that. They could, they could commute, commute your sentence. And what's it called? And what's it called in Hebrew? Chanina. That's, that's so. We're saying the Beinish Shalelam, even if we're just avodim, even if, you know, a little Chanina, a little grace, cut us some grace, cut us some slack. You wait till we deserve. After sit, we do we really need to sit the whole sentence? Enough already. Enough. Jewish people have suffered. We're trying. We're doing mitzvahs. We're trying to come home. We're, we're trying to connect to you. We're, try, we're, we're enough. But it flies in the face of the purpose of creation. This Hashem wouldn't give us something, a challenge we can't overcome, and on and on and on. So we're, we're acknowledging our ineffectiveness, and we want to be rewarded for it. We want... So, I mean, from that perspective, that, that, that we're asking for Hashem to cut us some slack, we shouldn't ask for Mashiach. <laughs> and yet, we see that our daily prayers necessitate that are asking for Mashiach. And, and, and you, know, you know, it says that when Hashem first created the world, it says He wanted to create it with Midat Hadin. Everything was going to be a meritocracy. Everything was going to be exactly what you earn and nothing more and nothing less. And what did Hashem see? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So really what Hashem wants to see from us is that we're, we want to come home. We're not perfect. Okay, we're not perfect. Okay, not. We have to make a little bit of an effort. But once you make a little bit of an effort, we plead with Hashem, Chaneinu, Chaneinu, be merciful. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So Chaneinu Hashem. Like. And here that Tzemach Tzedek goes on to say something else that I found very, very interesting. Tzemach Tzedek says, if you look in the Biyuri HaZohar, on... On the, on the verses that speak about Avraham Avinu's defense of his saying that Sarah was his sister. So Avraham Avinu says, but indeed she is. She is my sister. My half, it's really like his half-sister. She is kind of my grandfather's daughter. But it, it means it was like a granddaughter. Grandchildren, grandchildren are called children. They were, they were cousins. So there's a very interesting mimer from the Tzemach Tzedek in Buri Azair, where the Tzemach Tzedek says that there are two kinds of relationships that we could have with Hashem. There's the relationship of angels and the relationship of people. And he metaphorizes and says the relationship of angels is, is a relationship that's compared to siblings. Sibling love is not fiery. Sibling love is not passionate. Sibling love is not intense. But it's a constant. You care about your sibling. You just care about your brother and sister. That's no, normal. Normal brothers and sisters care about each other. It's the way it is. Romantic love is very, very intense. It has highs, it has lows. People fall in love, it's amazing, then it's not so good, they get into fights. That's it's very different. So so the Samat Sadik says there's there's the the wife metaphor and the sister metaphor. He says the malachim are like the sister metaphor. 
and, and we're like the wife. And he says, there's a virtue in each. There's a virtue in each. When the malachim want to get the Torah, what does Hashem tell them? He says to Moshe, but I answer them. What does Moshe say? Tell me, you guys have a Yetzirah? Oh, you don't have a Yetzirah. So what do you want the Torah? <laughs> you went to Mitzrayim? You have parents? So the Yetzirah and the things that are tempt, that tempt us constantly, this is, uh, it makes for a rocky relationship. And, and there's even like terminology of separation and divorce. There's all kinds of terrible stuff. Right? But, but, this is, but this is, all this language is used in our relationship with Hashem. And the nature of our relationship is intense and fiery. The word Isha, which means a wife, is also related to the term of Esh, Rishpe Esh, fiery love. And there's a chuka, there's a thirst, a romantic excitement, which is leprokim. It tapers off. It's the way it is. The relationship we have with our sister is not at all romantic or intense. It's very powerful. It's very profound. It's our sister. We care about our sister. And that's more like the malachim. The malachim do the same thing every day. It's very close to Hashem. Like, it's like a sibling relationship. So what Sadiq talks about this? It's a fascinating little mimer over here. <laughs> fascinating. He says like this. That you should know, he says, inasmuch as the angels are just like oimdim, they're predictable. Everything is predictable. There's no, no surprises there. Nonetheless, he says, a little bit of this koyach is also coming to, for us as well. That's why Avram says, achoysihi. He says to Sarah, you're my sister. Say you're my sister. There's a sister element too. And he says we have to try also to be close to Hashem in a sister way. Not in that loving, fiery, romantic way, which is like a, the wife metaphor, but a sister metaphor. And he says that's why the, 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 the expression is, Nasati mahalchim bein ha'imdim ha'elo. I placed mahalchim amidst the, the, the imdim. Neshama is amidst the malachim. Like we're included. And the Tzimach Tzedek says that yesh maila b'malochim masha'enim b'neshamas. There is a virtue in malochim that's not there with the neshamas. So what does he, what does he mean? What is his, what is it, why, why is he like, why is he sending us off here to this very unique conversation? It's a very rare actually, rare in Chassidus to have this kind of conversation, talk about the, the difference between the sister and the, 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 the sister and wife paradigm. So, he says like this. He says, sometimes our relationship isn't characterized by great love. And sometimes there isn't great passion. And sometimes it's just a dependence and just a commitment. And we say to Hashem that you are, we're like servants. We're like, we're like maid servants. But nonetheless, we're sated with scorn. That, that's also, there's also a virtue. There's a virtue in just servitude, subservience. Minus the love, minus the passion, minus the fervor, minus the excitement, minus the romance. But there's something to it. We're like, we're devoted. And that, he says, is part of the, that's part of the logic here. Part of the logic here is that we ask Kaddish Baruch Hu, our eyes are raised up to you like, a, like servants and maidservants. Yes, it's not the Ben and the Bas that we talked about, but nonetheless, there is meaning within that as well. There is cause within that kind of simple relationship too. So that's what the Tzimach Tzedek, uh, that's his comment on, 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 on this chapter of Tilim. And before I go on to the next verse, I want to share with you the words of the al of the Al-Sheikh. And I'm going to revisit the last, last, last episode also. So the al says that the second verse is a, Reca- in recap, recap of the Golos before, before the miracle of Purim. It's called Golos Paras. He says over there in the Megillah it says that Hashem, uh, pardon me, that, that the Esther Amalka says, if we were just sold as slaves, I would be quiet, but we're actually slated for genocide. Achashverosh took a payment, right? Haman said, I'll pay him, I'll buy him. What's the value of a life? I, I, pay, I pay for the Jews. He's buying the lives. So he said we're like slaves. 
And then, so we were like, avodim, we felt like slaves. Ayad adineim to Hashem. Esther, on the other hand, says, ke'ene shifcha, ayad givirta, singular. Avodim is plural. So the Alshach says, avodim referred to the whole nation. Shifcha referred to Esther HaMalka. Esther HaMalka came before Hashem as one person. Solitary, one individual. And our sages tell us that when she spoke to Achashverosh, she was really speaking to Hashem. The Mepharshim look at the precise words of, the, of Esther's request. And when she says the word HaMelech, she's talking about Hashem actually. So the Alshech says, that's, that's the paradigm of Purim. And then he says... That there is no mention of Hashem. In the, in the there's no mention of Hashem, correct. Hashem. correct. And then he says, verse 3, is Chonenu Hashem Kirav Sovainu Vuz. This was the story of Hanukkah. They were in our land. They stole our money. They raped our daughters. They violated the base of Migdash. It was the greatest scorn the greatest denigration in our land. We were here, we were home in Israel. And we were so harshly, terribly violated. And the Shekhinah seems to have left us. Is the Shekhinah so far away? So raising our eyes. So yes, the Shekhinah is still in the Kotel Amaravi. It says that in the Medeshaba. But Iker Shekhinah, he says, the main Shekhinah is a nostalgia. It seems to have gone away. And that's why we pray every day. Hamachazir Shekhinah tol Tzion. We ask Hashem to bring his Shekhinah back to Tzion. So he says, that's, that's, uh, that's really what's going on here. This is, both of these verses, he says, are illustrations of the length, the duration, and the intensity of Galut. And the last interesting thing I found in the Alshech is that he says something similar to Rav Vidal Tzafar, Tzafarti. He says, there's also a question of uh, bodily suffering. There's the Choneinu Hashem Choneinu, Kedav Sovainovuz. And he says, if you look in the next verse, it says... Rabbas Sovalon Hashem, verse 4 says, our souls have been filled. The first time it says, Rav Sovainovos, we've been sated with scorn. The second time it says, our souls are filled with scorn. So he says something similar to Rav Vidal. He says, verse 3 though, he says, it not, in, not in the Chaneinu Chaneinu, but he says that in verse 3, it's the material suffering. And in verse 4, it's our souls are filled with derision and scorn. So Rabbas Sovalon Hashem, Halag Hashananim, the mockery, the laughter, the, the, the denigration that ke- comes from the sha'ananim, from the complacent, habuz, the shame, the derision, the scorn, legeyoinim. <laughs> legeyoinim is a very, very funny word. Arrogant, the arrogant tormentors of the Jewish people. Let's take a look at Rashi. Rashi says, what is this business of halag ha'shananim? He says, lag ha'goyim ha'shananim. They're relaxed, they're complacent, life is great. And it's not for us. And Miranda seems just fine. It's not for us. And they're mocking us and the scorn they heap upon us. Habuzi says, Shabazu, this scorn that they gave us, it's lige yoinim. And he says the word gay is like a gorge, like a valley, because around the base of Migdash there are valleys. The area of the Kotel is called the Tyropian Valley. Gates al Mavet is Valley of Death. That's really Gai Hinom, where nothing is, uh, that's uh, further south, in the south area of the Harabais after Ir David. And then we have along the eastern flank, we have the Kidron Valley. So there's valleys all around. Beis Hamikdash is lifted up in a mountain. Shlaim is nestled by hills. It's in the valleys. And, and uh, the idea of Yonim is the Dov. So according to Rashi, the scorn is heaped upon Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is, is, is this vulnerable dove sitting in the valley who is being scorned and attacked from people all around. And it's not so hard to imagine that even in, the, even in our present circumstances. And Rashi says, you should know that this word is written as one word. However, it really is two words. It's read as two words. Lege yonim. But it's, it's written in the, in the actual Tilim in one word. So that's Rashi's approach. However, when we take a look in the Mitsudat Zion, as well as in the Ibn Ezra, he says 
that the geonim is referring to the scorners themselves. That the word gay is made up of the word gava, which means arrogant. And it comes melashoyin oinoa. Oinoa means to harass, to exploit, to abuse, to taunt, to tease. So this is the gay oinim. These are the arrogant tormentors of the Jewish people in the view of the Mitsudais Tzioin. And that is how uh, we kind of re-emphasize. So this is the business of Yerushalayim. This is what's going on. So we have to deal with the derision of the complacent is a reference to the nations who are living tranquil lives and they're mocking us. Or it's like the al says, we're in a state of constant movement. Halaga shananim, that we are always in movement and we can never seem to be ever to catch our breath. And the nations... They're very comfortable and very happy. And so this is describing the challenges, the difficulties of Galut. And then he says, like the geonim, the arrogant tormentors. It's interesting, the Mincha Shai points out there's only 15 words like this in the entire Jewish Bible, which are written as one word, but really two words. It's a very unusual word. And he says, it, it almost means that it comes together. The tormentors, their, their arrogance in, 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 and the torment that they give it's like it's a, it's a fusion of two things this, they're in an arrogant way they torment us it becomes like one word and according to Rashi it means uh, like I said the gay is referring to the doves in the, 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 the valley like a guy and the yonim refers to the dove of Yerushalayim the scorning of Jerusalem so that's our story my friends and it's a very long gullus and we have a lot of challenges. And uh, we're asking the Rabbi Nishalelam to put an end to it, to bring us home, to comfort his people. Im ka'avodim, im kibonim. And then even the higher madrega, we learned about avodim in the previous class. In any which way, it's high time for Golos to come to an end and for us to be brought home to Yerushalayim in the third base of Migdash with the coming of Mashiach, Bim Heira, will be Amenu speedily and in our days of Maine. Thank you for joining. Please, if you're watching out there, share, subscribe, support us, help us get the message out. And thank you guys for coming out. May we continue to merit learning Hashem's Torah, being uplifted by its messages, and to be zeicha, indeed, to the answer to our prayers with a respite in the last moments of Golos, and the wonderful ingathering, Bemheira, will be Amenu. Amen. Thank you.